Hello, and welcome to the LASERS presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Martha Booker Johnson, and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Stephen Goldstein. Stephen is an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Pittsburgh. Stephen's research interests are largely focused on African prehistory, environmental archaeology and geoarchaeology, community archaeology, lithic technologies, origins of pastoralism, and hunter-gatherer resilience. Please join me in welcoming Stephen as he gives his talk, A Deep Time Record of Farming, Migration, and Food Security at Kakapel Rock Shelter, Western Kenya. Thanks so much. So yeah, so my primary interests uh, have really always been in uh, mobile pastoralism in East Africa, as well as uh, to a degree hunter-gatherer archaeology. Uh, but I know that many of my colleagues, uh, uh, Kate Grillo and Mary Prendergast, amongst others, have already spoken uh, about some of these topics. So I'm going to talk about something I've been doing more recently, uh, which is farming, um, because we have some new, what I think is very exciting data about early farming in East Africa, uh, which has remained from an archaeological point of view, kind of a, a mystery um, until recently, very, very few data sets. Uh, and so what's gotten me sort of interested in, in doing uh, farming questions in East Africa uh, is that there's this kind of conception in popular culture and in media uh, of East Africa and Africa kind of broadly as being dominated by kind of drought, disease, and, and food system risk uh, to which people are you know, portrayed as having kind of little agency. Um, and this is a narrative about Africa that has gone back really to the origins of colonialism in East Africa, uh, where you get a great many quotes, uh, kind of like this one, uh, attributing so, uh, that they're saying there are inherent problems in East African farming, uh, quite specifically, um, and then subscribing some combination of Western science uh, and uh, ironically British administrative skill as the solutions to these, these problems. Um, and I would argue that that narrative has not fundamentally changed all that much. Um, if we look at the sort of FAO, UN reports on food security globally, uh, they often single out uh, and discuss Africa and often talk about the solutions being related to enhanced, uh, you know, Western driven GMO technologies and agricultural technologies, um, as well as kind of, you know, Western interventionist efforts as, as being necessary to support food production in the global south. Um, and the problem with these kind of portrayals of, of a kind of food insecure Africa um, is they entirely contradict what we know from the archaeological and historical records of the continent uh, as being a place where we saw the emergence of numerous, you know, very substantial high population density complex societies, uh, as well as many other small scale societies. Um, and this simply would not be possible without a kind of agricultural surplus, without systems of food security uh, that allowed these systems to exist. Um, and so it, this kind of contradiction between colonial and uh, post-colonial Western narratives of Africa and the archaeological and historical record, it kind of really drives me to fill these gaps um, and kind of combat the problem, which is that without a better archaeological record directly for what farming uh, and other food systems were in Africa, we can't kind of deconstruct this and challenge it. So um, before I sort of get to what we know about food production, we're going to take a quick step back uh, in space and time um, to a very different version of Africa. Uh, about 12,000 years ago, when Africa was much wetter, the intertropical convergence zone dropped much more rain across especially uh, northern and eastern parts of the continent. Um, those rainfall systems began to shift south after about 8,000 years ago, resulting in this cascade of, of in some regions, pretty rapid aridity, uh, culminating about 5,000 years ago, the end of this humid period, um, and onset of kind of drier conditions, more like uh, today. Uh, and we know that there was a lot of variability here, but overall, it's this kind of process that really seems to kick off and be the initial impetus toward shifts uh, in some regions, both toward mobile pastoralism and other areas toward the kind of very early experiments um, with plant agriculture. Uh, we have a, a somewhat better record for the development of pastoralism, of, of mobile herding, based primarily in cattle uh, with uh, sheep and goat absorbed from the Near East, starting somewhere in Northeast Africa around 7,000, 8,000 years ago, depending, um, and then slowly 
um, shifting uh, southward out of the Sahara as it's, as it's desertifying into East Africa and from East Africa as a corridor toward other parts of the continent. Uh, you'll notice there are a lot of data gaps here and even many of these sites, especially the ones in the south, just in the past year or two have been shown um, that these early domesticates aren't actually domesticated livestock. There are certain misidentifications. Um, and so even this is kind of a sparse record. But uh, we know much, much, much less about the spread of domesticated crops and farming strategies in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we know the origins roughly of these crops. So pearl millet, cowpea, yam originate in uh, West Africa and shifted uh, toward East Africa, we assume in, in relationship with this, uh, the broader, you know, quote unquote Bantu expansion. Uh, we know that sorghum originated in the Northeast and spread southward. We don't really know when. Um, and quite mysteriously, finger millet is domesticated somewhere in East Africa, but this we absolutely have no idea uh, exactly where or when that happened. So um, what we do know is that both for pastoralism and food production, we really highlight East Africa and the Rift Valley as a really critical corridor where these systems are all coming together for the first time to develop the kinds of food systems that have been uh, sort of propagated across Sub-Saharan Africa subsequently. So we really see the rift as a critical, critical zone for the development of African food systems um, involving these diverse crops. And so quite uh, that naturally draws me to, to want to work there uh, and to try to find evidence of these kinds of processes uh, of where and when different crops arrived and uh, you know, what people were doing uh, with them in different places. Uh, so we don't have a very clear definitive origin for plant agriculture in East Africa. We have so few examples of directly dated crops or even recovery of the seeds themselves from archaeological sites. Um, so what we can posit are a few major hypotheses um, for what, for how this initially happened. Um, the one hypothesis is that farming involving either sorghum or millet or some combination thereof came with early herders when they spread from the north somewhere on between 4,000 to, to 3,000 years ago. Uh, an alternative is that the earliest forms of food production were actually developed uh, locally by hunter-gatherer, uh, you know, fisher-forager populations prior to the migrations of farmers uh, or herders. Uh, a third alternative, um, what uh, probably is, is I, would, I would expect the most popular one, um, is that it's really this, this Bantu expansion that initially brings uh, farming to East Africa. Uh, and then finally, that uh, if it wasn't the Bantu expansion, if it wasn't any of these possibilities, then it's really not until uh, about 1600 years ago where we can definitively say, okay, now this is when uh, crops are in East Africa. And it just, that would be the earliest date and they were spread by kind of much, much later processes than we had previously thought. So to go through those, uh, I think a little bit critically, because I think there are some, some misconceptions uh, about what the evidence actually is and where it stands. Um, I just want to present a little bit of, of sort of the state of the art uh, on, on these different models. Um, so the idea that, that farming, uh, finger mill and or sorghum were spread by herders um, derives primarily and almost exclusively from kind of initial linguistic models. Uh, and, and those were really assumptions uh, quite explicitly so, that farming and pastoralism would move together like a kind of Neolithic package as kind of was at that time assumed for the Near East and, and uh, Asia and, and Europe um, uh, farming expansions. Uh, that was kind of folded into earlier archeological assumptions um, as kind of fact, even though it was not initially presented that way. And you start to get this kind of circular citation of the archeologist saying, well, we know this from the linguists and then linguists saying, well, we know this from the archeology. span um, But in fact, there is no direct archeological data for this. There is no recovery uh, of domesticated crops from any of these sites so far. We do have some things like groundstone and then larger settlements which, which have been suggested to be indicators of farming, uh, but that's rather indirect. Uh, and we don't have any evidence that herders had domesticated grains right now before about 1400 years BP. So again, it's, this remains very possible, um, but the data simply is not there. Uh, and again, we lack direct dates. So it, it you know, remains a little bit tenuous if we can support this hypothesis or not. Uh, the second is the possibility of early finger millet in Eastern Africa. 
Um, we know that uh, finger millet has a wide zone of, of its wild dis distribution. Uh, the centers of wild diversity, the, the areas that have long been proposed to be the most likely centers of domestication are in the Ethiopian and Ugandan highlands. Uh, the Ethiopian highlands was long preferred as the origin of finger millet um, based on one, the fact that other domesticated crops come from there. And so it was kind of natural that this one would too, uh, but also because of uh, a report from a site called Go Gobedra, uh, where it was claimed that they recovered finger millet um, from strata that were 5,000 years ago, or 5,000 years old. Uh, unfortunately, that was a guess by the excavator. Um, and later direct dating showed that those finger millet grains uh, were only at most 800 years old, probably uh, based on the calibration curves, significantly less than that, probably closer to 500, 600 years old. Unfortunately, that was never published, that date. Um, and so, the initial claim for 5,000 year old finger millet in Ethiopia has been sort of absorbed by um, a lot of plant geneticists continue to use that because this, you know, this uh, unfortunately actual date uh, isn't known. So we actually don't have much evidence for early finger millet. There are a few fragmentary isolated examples from other areas in Sub-Saharan Africa, but again, not directly dated and it's only one or two pieces here and there. So uh, really, there's no evidence right now for any early use of finger millet. It doesn't show up again until about 1400 uh, years ago um, in a, a, anywhere where we can sort of claim. Uh, the third hypothesis that, that agriculture was introduced through the Bantu expansion, um, this has somewhat better uh, evidence here that populations moving you know, from the Congo Basin, either on northern or southern routes, um, delivered this. Uh, at some point around 2,500 years ago uh, is the date that often is stated. Uh, unfortunately, again, the only sites, only a few sites in Uganda and, and Rwanda have yielded uh, examples of domesticated seeds for excavations um, and the radiocarbon dates for those sites, not the seeds uh, again, but the sites um, would suggest not until maybe, um, you know, 400 AD, so about 1,600 years ago, uh, was there any far evidence of farming? And here at sorghum and pearl millet show up quite a bit earlier uh, and uh, not till centuries later, actually, does East African finger millet arrive. So that would suggest there's a connection to the Bantu expansion, but the chronology um, is quite a bit off. One uh, project I've been working on is remodeling evidence for Bantu expansions uh, into East Africa, connected at, with the best proxy and material culture. So, you know, this is very kind of tangential um, evidence, uh, but that would suggest that based on the radiocarbon dates that we have, in fact, the Bantu expansion uh, would have, at best, would have been quite a bit later based on any archaeological uh, proxies for it. Um, we don't have any, any of that until maybe 2300, 2200 in East Africa proper, bringing us a little bit closer to those, those domesticated dates at 1600 BP, uh, but still quite a gap. If we look at pace of expansion, uh, you know, generated from the same modeling, uh, we see one reason why this might be this very, very slow expansion into East Africa and only quite a bit later does that the pace uh, of migration likely increase, um, probably because if you're shifting out of lowland Congo Basin uh, environments into highland East African environments, different climate system, different rainfall, different environment, uh, you can't simply adapt any farming system that does exist uh, quite easily. And so we might see this long delay in sort of developing a, or adapting an agricultural economy to these very, very different conditions uh, in East Africa and in and around the Rift. So that's sort of the state of play, which is very nebulous. Uh, we you know, don't have super strong data in any one direction. Um, and so one thing I've been very lucky to do is sort of add a, a couple of data points from a site at, at Kakapel Rock Shelter, uh, just a uh, little bit north of Lake uh, Victoria on kind of the hilly uh, flanks of Mount Elgon, right really at the intersection where we should see early farming um, coming from West Africa, as well as uh, mobile herder strategies, whether or not they, they had crops um, coming from the north. So a kind of a contact area, which also has a large forager history. So a place where I was hoping that we might detect a lot of different food systems kind of interacting through time. Uh, it is a national monument site because of the, the rock art panel uh, that you can see there. 
And so the site is under the uh, stewardship of the National Museums of Kenya. Uh, and they sort of did some initial survey work, found these deposits and invited us to kind of partner with them for a, a more substantial uh, series of excavations between 2017 and, and 2020. So you can see there's a, a large fence protecting the rock art, which makes excavating very interesting. Um, but we've now been excavating there a couple of seasons. We've done some paleo environmental work um, in the area. And so we're hoping to, to continue this on at this rock shelter site uh, and surrounding ones. There's, uh, there's a number of areas we hope to continue exploring. Uh, but we've excavated quite a bit of, of the main shelter. Um, I think probably as much as we're, we're going to do, I want it to, to leave the rest intact, uh, but enough to get a fairly high resolution record um, of the site. So we have one very nicely stratified sequences. Uh, you can see lots of features here. I'll show those, those later, but uh, a really kind of clear stratigraphy um, with lots of, of dates for that. Um, I show this, this is uh, the piece plotted artifacts from uh, one of the trenches, just to kind of show that there's extremely dense archeological material here. Uh, lots of pottery, lots of lithic, um, and very, very large animal bone uh, assemblages. So it really is uh, a remarkably rich site. Moving further away from the, the shelter wall itself, we start to get kind of a nicer separation here between these nice uh, Iron Age pottery rich levels at the very top, dating to about a thousand years to the present, um, separated from these uh, later Stone Age, you know, 6,000 and older layers at the bottom. So those kind of converge once you get to the very back of the shelter um, where there's much denser occupation, but the site really extends over quite a large area um, and different kinds of periods of time you know, occupations or overlapping uh, very complexly. Uh, but to, to summarize what we know of the occupations, we have across the whole site a pretty significant presence of the fisher foragers uh, who lived all around Lake Victoria from the early Holocene uh, right up until about 22, 2000 years ago. The end is a little bit blurry, uh, but we have pretty much the full sequence. Um, of that time period, very few gaps in, in the radiocarbon dating so far. And I think we could actually fill those in um, if we kind of expanded excavation. So uh, significant use of the site by them. Interestingly, one of the most interior uh, sites attributed to the Cansior, sort of furthest from the lake. So there was a, a terrestrial component to their economy as well. We have very much just in the back of the shelter, a small, small pocket of what we call the Urewe. This is associated with the, the early Iron Age. Uh, it is associated with the arrival of Bantu speaking peoples. You know, again, that's hard to totally, you know, corroborate from just pottery, but that is the general interpretation uh, of Urewe. It, but it is only a very minor component of the archeological uh, strata here. What we do have is a very, very substantial sequence also of later Iron Age populations. Um, probably a couple of different uh, linguistic groups from, from Nilotic and uh, 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 Bantu speakers that moved through here in the past couple thousand, uh, past thousand years or so. Uh, but we have very intensive occupations uh, attributed to this, this period. Uh, we also have a lot of, of decorative artifacts, so lots of beads, um, some sort of toggles, uh, quite a, some bone tools from the site as well. So really, uh, remarkable preservation of those. You can see some ochre um, still kind of adhering to some of these beads, which is uh, very cool. Uh, we have a lot of radiocarbon dates for the site. This is, this, these are actually old. I think we have, we just sent off several more. Um, so it will be by, by uh, fairly soon, one of the highest resolution Holocene occupations um, in East Africa, for, at least for the Holocene, uh, where we really have several dates um, to really pinpoint when these occupations were. Uh, and to date different kinds of archaeological material. We have been very lucky in the recovery of uh, ancient DNA remains from a number of skeletons that the National Museums of Kenya excavated originally um, in their pilot work, um, which we published um, uh, in 2020. So we have uh, three samples so far, the most interesting of which picture here dates to about 3,900 years ago, so very much in this early fisher forager period. Um, and the genetic ancestry shows significant uh, alignment with, you know, initial East African kind of forager clades, but very interestingly shares uh, some ancestry with contemporary Mbuti populations. So this 
potentially suggests uh, that foragers were interacting uh, between Central and Eastern Africa uh, to some fairly considerable degree prior to, to the, to the uh, Bantu expansion. Um, and this would be the first evidence of that. Um, the next ADNA signature, this 900 BP individual, um, looks very much like this kind of later Iron Age pastoralist thing that we also uh, were, was detected in, in Prendergast at all for the Central Rift. So it looks like this is a, a wave of herders coming in, absorbing the early pastoral Neolithic herders, probably, you know, again, some agricultural component. Um, and then, you know, multiple uh, Bantu and, and uh, Nilotic speaker groups have, have come through here before the contemporary Tesso people who live there today. So we have evidence of multiple uh, migrations through the site. Um, and we know that there were more that we are, aren't detecting just yet in the archaeogenetics. Uh, but for me, what makes the site extremely exciting is the preservation of archaeological features, um, some of which are, are shown here. Um, now, these are not, you know, textbook dramatic examples, but I can tell you, having worked in East African archaeology for quite some time, um, you never get this many, you know, they're all on top of each other, hearths, ash dumps, these kind of pottery features, um, other kind of refuse pits and middens just piled on top of each other. It's, it's a remarkable density of, of, of archaeological features, um, especially for this region. And that has been entirely ex exceptionally promising for the preservation of plant remains, uh, which is also a, a major challenge in East Africa. So now uh, to get to the meat of what we found um, in the subsistence data of what were people eating, what was their agricultural um, economy looking like through time, through all of these different migration episodes. So starting uh, with the animal bones, um, in this early forager period, we find uh, primarily reliance through that on sort of me medium-sized bovids, uh, some use of, of smaller bodied uh, bovids, quite a large number of uh, cane rat, uh, and hyrax, some of that is taphonomic, sort of naturally in the shelter, um, reptiles, fish, uh, things like that, um, and then a sort of small diversity of other things, sewids, uh, you know, and what have you. Um, moving into the early Iron Age, such as it is, uh, we have, you know, basically the same profile with the addition of more larger bodied animals. Uh, we have one leopard bone from a tooth, uh, which I only include because I think that's cool. Um, and we also have one cow bone, which has been directly dated to about 2300 years, 2200 years ago, um, and also using uh, Zoom's uh, archaeology by mass spectrometry has been definitively confirmed to be a domesticated uh, cow. So this would be uh, one of the earliest cows in the Lake Victoria Basin that's been uh, directly dated and confirmed. Uh, so that's quite interesting that happens. Uh, in the early Iron Age at this at this time, when we would expect um, early Bantu people, speaking people, to be to be first coming in. Finally, getting into the late Iron Age, again, virtually the same profile uh, of fauna at the site. There's a slight increase in domesticated stock, cattle, sheep, and goats, but it remains a tiny minority of the economy, which is still reliant on almost principally uh, wild animals. And that remains the case into contexts that are 200, 300 years ago. So hunting really was a staple of this system um, for the entire Holocene. Uh, but what is a little bit more exciting than that is the agricultural remains, the, the direct remains of ancient plant foods. Um, and we achieved this really through a rigorous program of archaeobotanical sampling and archaeological flotation. Um, this is a pretty simple process. You very carefully excavate a bunch of dirt, uh, measuring it, and agitate it in a bucket of water. All the carbonized remains float to the top. You skim them off, dry them, identify them uh, in a lab uh, for you know what what species they they represent. And all this archaeobotanical work, I have to give tremendous credit to my colleague Dr. Natalie Mueller at Washington University in St. Louis, who has been heading all this up uh, and who keeps us. Uh, very, very sternly to the exact protocols for this. Um, and it has been tremendously successful. Um, and as well as the assistance of uh, Dr. Uh, Rita Del Martello, who's done a lot of the archaeobotanical identifications as well. So I owe a tremendous uh, amount to their contributions uh, to this project. So what have we found? 
um, a lot of seeds, a huge amount. So orders of magnitude beyond what has been recovered from any other archeological site in the interior of East Africa. Um, only on the coast are there other sites that have yielded uh, fairly large assemblages. Uh, these numbers are actually even out of date now. Natalie is, is still working through the 2020 samples. Uh, we sampled like 2000 um, liters of, uh, so there's really a lot to work through. But what we do definitely have are lots of Eleusine corcana. This is finger millet. Um, at the, and that's the, the sort of round guy at, at the top. This is the vast majority uh, of the seeds that we found. But we also find some of the wild progenitor the uh, Coracana subspecies Africana occurs right along that in every context where we find the domesticate, we find some of the wild. We have sorghum. We have quite weirdly peas, just kind of normal Near Eastern pea. Um, it could also be the Ethiopian pea, which is a very close relative of the Near Eastern pea, but somehow peas are getting down here uh, at some point. Um, they're not grown in the area today, so we're still trying to figure out what, what happened to the pea. Um, but we have some contexts with like a dozen of these, you know, just 300 years ago. So up until recently, they were being grown at the site. And we have some examples of what is most likely cow pea, uh, as well as a tremendous diversity of wild species uh, and things that we have not yet been able to identify that may have been sort of wild plant foods or used as medicines. Um, so we're hoping to do more ethnobotanical work to kind of expand what we're able to positively identify from the site. In terms of the radiocarbon dating, so a major problem has been direct dates on seeds. Um, and these things are small, especially the African domesticates, especially uh, finger millet, Ellison corcana. Uh, they can move a tremendous amount through the sequence. And so you really, really, really need direct dates to for sure say, when these things were grown. Um, and it's hard with coracon because it's so small, it doesn't always yield enough carbon. Uh, we've tried to do a pretty expansive amount of dating. Um, and of what we have been able to date, we all of the finger millet dates to within the last 1100 years. Uh, we have not been able to find any examples older than that, even though some of these are being recovered from like meters down in the sequence in what should be early forager levels. Um, it, the, they're just way too small and they're moving dramatically throughout the profile. So when I make the point that we have these other examples that aren't directly dated, this is why, because we really need to question, you know, any as association dates um, for when this happens. Sorghum, uh, we get at about 900 years BP. This is not moving so much. It's usually in features that have late Iron Age material. Um, and finally, uh, these peas, again, arrive also sometime about 900 BP, so also kind of probably late Iron Age introduction. Now, then we get to uh, the what are likely cow peas. Um, these are difficult to definitively identify as cow pea, uh, but based on their size and shape, that's most likely what they are. Um, there are very few other examples, and at this size, it's definitely a legume. It's almost definitely domesticated. This is probably the only thing it can be. Um, we find these only in that very specific pocket of the site where we have Urewe material, um, which would kind of enhance the hypothesis that that does represent some uh, kind of connection with Bantu speakers or it was related in some way to that process uh, because this is a West African domesticate. Um, and the direct dates on the cowpea so far uh, put us around 2200, around 2300, somewhere in that range. BP. So this would be by far uh, the earliest directly domesticated plant food in Eastern Africa. Um, and it happens to be a West African domesticate. So returning to these uh, major hypotheses, um, it is possible that Neolithic uh, herders had some degree of agriculture, but there is no evidence for it yet. So that it's tenuous to, to support that uh, without firm evidence. Um, same goes for early forager cultivation of finger millet. We just don't have evidence, and this seems somewhat less likely. Um, however, two things seem to be true. So far, based just on this, it does look like the uh, West African introduction of crops was the first crop introduction into Eastern Africa. At the same time, these things don't really stick around. Like pearl millet, the major West African grain, 
is not a staple across much of East Africa relative to the importance of finger millet and sorghum, uh, which appear much later in time. So we're really asking two questions. When does the first domesticate kind of appear? And when does the kind of uh, African agricultural complex as we would kind of define them today kind of emerge? And those seem to happen at, at two different times. So there's kind of this gradual accumulation of different crops at different times um, as different sort of waves of people come into contact with each other. Um, and it's, it's really important to recognize that these kind of local choices about crop selection are probably ongoing um, in many different places and time. So Cockapel is only uh, one site, uh, but it's one site where the evidence seems to show one, that agricultural systems one still maintained strong evidence of, of hunting. Um, they were they were continued to be focused on wild resources. And we have to support the hypothesis that the earliest crops so far directly dated come in uh, association in some connection with what we would refer to kind of broadly as this Bantu expansion. Um, but these local choice uh, system, these local choices and agencies in how people manage their crop economy are continuing to evolve as different things become available, as environment shifts, people are making different kinds of choices um, across space and time. And we would expect really that that should be the case, that we, in different parts of East Africa, we have vastly different ecologies, vastly different soil conditions uh, and geologies, that one uh, agricultural economy would not work, and we would tr see tremendous local uh, diversity in different places. Um, and I think the only way that Cockapel is going to be truly representative um, is in this, this pattern of multiple different crops coming in at different points in times, probably people making different choices at different periods. Um, and I, I do kind of think what we will see is, even if there were earlier forms of farming, they probably like a cockapel remain very small scale and ephemeral. And it doesn't appear to be this until the much later periods, until the late Iron Age after around 1200, that we start to see a real significant agricultural uh, economies uh, emerging uh, in different parts of, of at least the interior of East Africa, possibly like on the coastal regions that happens earlier, but at least within the Rift Valley, um, this is probably a much later development out of a lot of small uh, different food systems coming together. Um, and I will just mention some, some survey work uh, I did this last summer, uh, 2022, because it gives us at least one slight comparison point. So I'm not just talking about one site. Um, from uh, Kapsu Rap Shelter up on the Owasan Gishu Plateau. Uh, this is the breadbasket of Kenya today. It's the richest, most high producing agricultural area. So if people were farming, you would expect they would be doing it up here. Um, in this rock shelter, we did just text excavations, but we're getting lots of, of features here too, which is very promising. We're getting large uh, collections of charcoal uh, and plant remains, but so far, uh, even in these, these kind of big pastoral Neolithic layers, uh, no domesticated species here either. So again, makes it challenging to associate any kind of early farming um, with, with these early herders, at least in this region at this time. Uh, and so I think that gives us at least just an initial insight into food systems uh, and the emergence of different forms of food security across Africa and showing how complex they are, um, how much agency local people had in managing their own choices about food systems. Um, that's certainly something we'd like to continue exploring. Uh, and certainly we need far more data than just one site. Uh, but I hope that at least that one site kind of shows one that we do have the potential for plant remains uh, in East Africa, at least in these, these cave and rock shelter sites. Um, and we can start building a complex model, not just for, you know, when did farming arrive, uh, but also how did different foodways emerge and change and adapt to complex change in climate um, and social conditions uh, over the past few thousand years. Uh, and so I have to thank, of course, uh, the team that's worked on that and all the funding organizations. Um, and thank you all so much uh, for you know, being here today to hear me report on the site. Thank you very much for your presentation. We can now begin the question and answer section. The question and answer section will be open to voice questions as well as written questions. If you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand in the nonverbal controls present underneath the participant panel.
and we'll send you a request to unmute. If you prefer to ask a written question that is also still possible, you can do so using the Zoom chat module, and as usual, I will read out the question. Please remember that the webinars are recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. Marta? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. This was so useful for me and I was, I've always been wondering about, uh, yeah, the agriculture, when did it really start in, in Africa? I'm a, I'm a linguist and I work in, in the Tanzanian uh, Rift Valley area. Uh, the th think about finger millets, what, what I'm, uh, is a naive question, so uh, sorry. Um, you showed where we have the, um, the wild species of finger millets, and so I wonder um, why do we have to assume that the domestication happened only once? Yeah, we we definitely don't. I mean, I think you know we're trying to move beyond these kind of simpler models for domestication everywhere, um, and because the there's so many wild variations of finger millet, it interbreeds with the domesticated one very very readily. Um, which means even as you're starting to cultivate this, you're going to get introgression from wild species. So you're going to, so the domestication is all is going to look very messy, kind of no matter what, because you can't not have it interbreeding with the wild stuff. It grows around the fields today. Uh, you can easily, you, you know, pick it up. So um, the domestication for finger millet and all, especially small seeded grains, is tremendously complicated, um, and that's what drew. Uh, Natalie Mueller uh, to want to work on this crop. She mostly works in, in North American small seed contexts, um, but really needing, recognizing this need to develop better models for this. Um, it's certainly possible it could have been, you could have different strains domesticated in different places um, that can get mixed up at different times. That's that's likely, I've, I've we've discussed that possibility, but um, yeah, we just need way more. We need to find it basically other places. Uh, interestingly, I work with a geneticist uh, that works specifically on finger millet at Icrasat in Nairobi, um, and they found some very interesting data that kind of might suggest multiple domestication events, or at least a very early dispersal and then rapid diversification. So, um, yeah, I think we're just beginning to pay attention to some of these East African crops to, to figure that out. So in the area in Tanzania Rift Valley, the, 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 the Cushitic people there, to them, the, the finger millet is they have to feel that that is the most original crop, although it's it's not ideal for where they uh, live and, and grow crops now. Uh, and for them, the the peas is something typical for the Bantu people there. It's just a side. There's a question from Amani Lusikelo in the chat. Do you happen to have come across the crop black beans that is called nguala in Bantu languages of Tanga? I failed to find literature on its transference from point of origin to Tonga. Um, I find the word Nguala in Nilotic foraging Akie. Uh, not, not yet, um, but we unfortunately don't have a lot of occupations at the sites where I've been working that are, are definitely correlated with what we think are Bantu speaking peoples. Um, so we're not seeing much of that economy. Like I think we're very lucky to pick up anything on some of these few cowpeas. Uh, we don't have any pearl millet, which we would expect they were growing as well. Um, so I think, yeah, the, I think we need to excavate more sites. I think expand some of these kind of rock shelter flotation projects toward Uganda, where there's a number of sites that probably have great preservation and there's sites in Tanzania as well. So uh, not, not yet, but we also have things that we haven't identified yet. So um, it, it's, it's possible we need to discuss, you know, what some of these crops are that maybe aren't, aren't well described uh, in other literature. So I was wondering about um, how you know whether something is grown locally or versus whether it's something that people might have gotten from another group. Yeah, and this this is a question that comes up a lot in archaeology because it's hard to, to test that with the kind of materials that we have. Um, I think we have to kind of default to local, like that people aren't, aren't shipping, you know, tremendous amount of grains. There, there's possible trade going on, but we're probably not talking about, you know, over hundreds and hundreds of kilometers um, here. We're, we're, we're and, and at this scale, we're getting hundreds and hundreds of finger millet seeds. You know, it's certainly more parsimonious that there's 
something local going on. It's certainly like possible when we find these, uh, you know, few legumes or whatever that they were traded from some contact with a group. Um, but at that point, we know that the agriculture is on the landscape, fairly close on the landscape at that time. Um, so it depends, I guess, on your definition of local versus, versus not. Uh, but I think in general, we're not seeing tremendous long range movement of, of plants. It's, it's possible. I mean, it would be cool to go, but that's, it's just hard to, to know with, with these samples. Yeah, I guess I was thinking about it more with the beans or something than with the um, finger millet, but thank you. Marta? Yes, but I think it's more or less a similar or the same question, because when I think of these rock shelters, um, I, I would see that as, as the kind of environment uh, for the hunter gatherers and not that much for, uh, for the farmers. So I would assume that these, uh, these, these, these finger millet uh, were through uh, exchange with uh, yeah, local farmers. Um, and is that also how you see it or? Um... Yeah, I think that it's, it's changed quite a bit through time. Um, I, I think some of them were very ephemeral occupations. You may have people moving from one place to another uh, or like they're on hunting trips and they're stopping by, um, that's, that's quite likely. In the late Iron Age, at least, the density of, of features suggests some kind of longer term or at least more intensive use of the site. And we know, and we know at least within the last couple hundred years, there were residences very close up to the shelter. It's not a very deep, deep, deep shelter. So um, we know it was used a little more intensively. But in the late Iron Age, definitely, there's hunt, there's hards and ash pits. So like, there really was significant activity there, whether or not they were living there or stop or, or stopping through there regularly. Um, definitely in the very early periods when it's when it's foragers, I think they're very short term, like seasonal hunting camps. I don't think they're living uh, at the site. But yeah, more dating would, would, I think, help that a little bit. But I do, I do think it's a problem that you're getting changing use of the shelter at different times by different groups, which is presenting some bias on what's getting up there. The problem is the shelters are just the, the only places where we have good chance for preservation. Um, so and the, the, the open air sites have always yeah. just been a major problem. So yeah. we have to we have to just acknowledge that is a, is a bias, yeah. Another question from Amani. Do ancient crop remains tally slash match in any way with ancient remains of animals to allow agro-pastoral Bantu right from the beginning? Or do we still maintain that Bantu adopted animal keeping from Nilotic people. And he adds, I ask as a linguist, I don't have good background of archeological studies. Certainly I would suggest that the, that, that pastoral economy as it was adopted, as, as you sort of see it spreading in Southern Africa has to be through contact with East African peoples. Um, and we happen to find an early West African crop at about the same date as an early cow bone. We can't say that that represents the same people doing the same thing at the same time, but we know that at least cattle and these crops were available on this landscape at roughly contemporaneous periods. I am really, one of the reasons I'm trying to work at these other sites is trying to see where these pastoralists and farmers are actually meeting. Um, it's, it's possible it's right around here. You know, this is a major, could have been a major interaction zone. We know herders are just on the other side of the lake at the same time. We don't have great evidence for them to the north. I, I think, you know, it's very likely they were there. So, it it remains likely. I would I would agree that this is through contact. It just we we may not be catching the initial phases of it. It may have happened earlier. It may be very, you know, loose across a, a big landscape. So that's exactly what I, I'm really hoping to trace out a little bit better. I don't know if this is sort of an answerable question within the time frame, um, but you pulled up. Um, or on some of your slides, you had images of, I think, ceramic or some other sort of material that has designs in it. And you sort of labeled them as Fisher Forager and something else and something else. And so is it from the patterns or the materials? Sort of how do you know um, which of those groups those belong to? Yeah, luckily, I mean, so I'm not a ceramicist, so I have to rely on the, the sort of the published uh, uh, literature. But luckily, the, the sort of designs and the methods of, of the making those decorations and making the ceramic itself, as well as the, the vessel shape, are pretty substantially different between what these early foragers were doing. And they have very little, there is some change, but there's a pretty continuous tradition long before anyone else got there, uh, you know, this indigenous pottery tradition. So you, we, you keep finding them making basically the same 
types of things. They're, they're, they are changing and evolving, but very intensely decorated kind of lattice motifs and things. The Urewe is starkly different. It, these very linear uh, designs, motifs, very different kind of rim shapes. Um, and then the late Iron Age, which runs up until ethnohistoric kind of period. So people are still making pots with these very kind of roulette uh, decorations, these very thick decorated bands just around the rim. So in this area, there happen to be very good seriations of at least those major categories. Connecting them to specific groups is a big problem. And we I do that very tenuously, um, especially in the late Iron Age where it is very complicated. People are making similar kinds of things. But, um, and there's there are other pottery types that we just don't have good dates for. They're not well studied. So it is more complicated than, than that. I just can't speak to that just yet. I'd like to kind of get a sense for what these other weird things are. Um, but yeah, we just need more excavations basically. All right, I will ask you one more question. Um, so I work sort of in the Southern Highlands of Tanzania, so not actually quite in the Rift Valley. And most of what people grow is corn, which is obviously not showing up in the archeological record. And I guess I just wonder sort of, I don't know about how these newer crops might be interacting. And maybe this is outside of what you look at, but. Yeah, we did write a, a grant to kind of investigate that more. I really focus more on historic time periods to see when these changes are going. Um, from uh, the sort of ethno history uh, and oral history, this is a much more recent thing in this area. Um, you know, obviously the, there was a big colonial push toward, you know, shifting the economy over to maize, even though initially it was not as productive as sorghum and finger mill. They, they were more productive than corn, but now we've had billions of dollars spent to make, you know, GMO corn more productive. Um, so I, you know, I, I think it's an unfair comparison today, but uh, here it's much more recent and sorghum still is grown, or finger mill especially is still grown tremendously in the rift. Uh, or in, in at, at Kakapel in that area, but in there there it's within the last you know hundred years really, and the the increased traffic along the road to Uganda, which runs very close to the site, that is kind of herb started a process of urbanization and more intensified kind of farming um, as cascade off as well as like cash crops in the past you know 50, 60 years have really you know people growing more tobacco and things like that. So and again I think is is a, a mosaic. Um, there are historical accounts of places where people really resisted, you know, early maize introductions, places where it was adopted in as kind of a buffer interseasonal crop earlier. So, uh, yeah, and, and it's, it's probably going to be very, very diverse across different regions based on what, pe again, what people's local agency in a long history of choosing to incorporate or not incorporate crops that worked or didn't work for their um, specific region. So especially as you move between different kind of rainfall patterns. You're probably going to see very diverse choices about about what crops people do and, and don't, and then getting into you know colonial post colonial periods. There's globalization, other very unfortunate complex pressures. Thank you. I think those are all of the questions and comments for today. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page, and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. I would like to thank Stephen again for his presentation and everyone else for participating today. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar on Wednesday, the 16th of November by Terrell Schrock and titled Non-Contiguous Metathesis in Ick and its Implications for East African Etymology.